We're going to start a brand new sermon series today, which is unusual. I don't normally like to start it on a Sunday. We're not sure about it, and, and we haven't been here for an Iron Man, so we weren't sure how it's going to affect the church. But can I just say, I've been incredibly impressed at how resourceful people are, either to leave early, to find different routes, to make a plan. Johan and Valda, I don't know how you did it. I'm not sure. To me, there's not many routes coming from where you guys live in Donabai and, you know, that sort of side of things. So all of you who have made a plan from all these different areas, I just think it's absolutely wonderful um, that you would make the effort and the plan to be here today. And so today I'm going to start the series, and I love to every now and again do a series on a book of the Bible. And so this year, I have done one already. I normally like to do two a year. Why? Because by and large, not you guys, but other churches, by and large, the church is quite biblically illiterate. By and large, if you said there was, you know, the book of Zechariah, and people, hmm, what, what, is that even, in? like, what does it say? What does it mean? People don't know their Bibles well anymore. And it's worth knowing your Bible. It's worth reading your Bible. It's worth knowing the Word of God. It is a worthwhile exercise to spend time once a day in the Word of God. It doesn't have to be hours. We're not all, you know, we don't all have the hours to spend praying and reading the Word. But to get something of the Word of God in every single day is well worth it. And so this book that we're going to cover over the next four weeks, we're going to do it today and the next three weeks, is the book of Ephesians. Yay, Ephesians. It's a, it's a cool book. It really is. It's a great, great book or letter. Of course, it is a letter that Paul wrote, but we, we, it's one of our 66 books of the Bible. And to help you in terms of making this a part of your daily devotional time, I've picked out a devotional from the Bible app. Um, if we can show that, most of you by now probably have that Bible app, that old school brown Bible app on your thing. It is so helpful. That is a wonderful tool to have on your phone. It's most probably the top three apps that you've got on your phone. You may not even know it or use it, but it is. And so it's free. You download that. And then in that app, I think right in the middle on the bottom is a little word that says plans. And if you click on plans and you search specifically for this, sit, walk, stand, you're going to get an image similar to that. It's a 40-day devotional. Whew. It's going to outlast the series, actually. <laughs> You're going to be doing this into Christmas unless you do two days in one day or something like that. But it's a wonderful way to go through the book of Ephesians to get the most out of it. You'll find that I'll be preaching, and you're going to pick up hints and things that you've got out of your daily devotional. Now, some of you already have your own daily devotional space, and you're doing your own thing. I do the Bible in a year. I've got my own way of doing it. If you want to add this to that, you can. But if you don't have any devotional structure, I would really encourage you to just download this and start with something. And this is a great way, I think, to start as we launch into a new series. You can even start this when you get home a little bit later. Is that okay? So, Ephesians, sit, walk, stand. Why on earth have I called it sit, walk, stand? That comes from a little guy with a little book. A little guy is a church leader from China named Watchman Nee. Some of you know his stuff if you've been around. He's written a lot of little books about discipleship and, and how to live uh, the Christian life. And one of the books that he put, puts out is actually called Sit, Walk, Stand. And in that book, he goes through Ephesians, the letter, and he says this is actually a pattern for Christian maturity. He says he can see it in the book of Ephesians, and you can see it. Once you're looking for it, you can see it very easily, and you'll actually see it in a lot of books and letters throughout the Bible, but he uses Ephesians as his background, and he goes into it, and he says, if we take a look at Ephesians, the order is important. You sit, then you walk, then you stand. You sit, understanding what God has done for you that you sit in heavenly places with Christ, that you have an inheritance, that you have spiritual blessings, that you would know who you are in Christ first. Then you walk. Then you do. Then you talk. Then you live out the life. But if you get that order wrong, you find you're just tired. 
You find I'm trying to do things for God, but you've never sat and understood, understood who you are in Christ first. And so this book highlights that. First sit, then walk, and then understand that you're in a spiritual battle and you've got to stand. And so he goes through this, and it's very powerful. So that devotional that I gave is actually going to walk you through sit, walk, stand, and Ephesians almost at the same time, which is similar to what we're going to do in this series. So I just think that's extremely helpful in terms of how to understand the book of Ephesians. So as I go into this, today's message is the introduction. Don't switch off because it's the introduction. There will be some meat in here. There will be some stuff that you can take and apply and, and really hold on to from today. But it really is the introduction message because I want you to know how things fit into things. Where does this book fit in? Who wrote it? Where? Why? What for? And so a bit of background, context to the book of Ephesians, hopefully you're going to find helpful. The first thing, who do you think established the church in Ephesus? For a brownie. <laughs> Who said that? Absolutely. Well done. (laughs) You could say that about most of the churches. Hey, you'd probably get it right eight out of 10 times. But that's true. So Paul started it for a brownie. Okay, you go to them and you tell them, you tell them Dolan sent you. Okay, (laughs) give them the secret knock and then they'll release the brownies. Okay, so Paul established the church in Ephesus. That's true. Um, And you might know that he went on three missionary journeys. One thing that Paul did do, which we don't really see the other disciples doing to the same degree, is he took Jesus very seriously when when Jesus said, go out into all the world. Because that was his great commission, right? Matthew 28, go out into all the world, preach, baptize, teach people how to live. And I'll be with you till the end of the age, right? So that was the Great Commission, and and that was what he told all of his followers to do. But what you don't really see a lot of them doing is actually that. They eventually kind of get there. But Paul took that commission incredibly seriously. And we know that he got saved on the way to Damascus, and he had this radical conversion. He spent some years sort of learning the Christian doctrine. And then he did exactly that. And he took three missionary journeys. And missionary journeys aren't like they are here. You don't get in the bus and go to Lesotho or you sail and it's hard and you're at the mercy of the wind and the waves and in his case the Greeks and the people who would have been against him the Gentiles um, the Jews all the people who would have been against him it was a difficult difficult thing that took a significant amount of energy and time we know Paul's story he was shipwrecked and he was beaten and he was stoned and he was left for dead and it was a tough thing to do but he took three missionary journeys and he established some churches, and then he, he uh, solidified those churches and put leadership in those spaces as well. So this was one of those that he did. And he planted this particular church on his second missionary journey. Here's how it happened in Acts 18, verse 19 to 21. It says this, they stopped first at the port of Ephesus. Ephesus was a big, bustling City. It wasn't some little obscure place in the middle of nowhere. It was, a, it was a properly established big city. And they stopped first at the port of Ephesus where Paul left the others behind. While he was there, he went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews. So he went to what he would have known. Remember, Paul was a very well-schooled Jewish uh, person. And so he could easily, he could, he could argue the scriptures maybe better than most. And he went and he Uh, to reason with the Jews. Don't you love that? They asked him to stay longer. There was obviously something about what he said that was attractive to them, but he declined. As he left, however, he said, I'll come back later, God willing. Then he set sail from Ephesus. This is so so this is Paul taking a really short, it's it's almost like a little footnote in the book of Acts. They start on their journey. The first place they stop is Ephesus. Everyone gets off the boat. Paul leaves his crew. He goes and he preaches. Everyone says, oh, can you stay long? He says, no, no, I can't stay long. I've got places to be. Goes back to the boat, gets on there, and and he's gone. Well, thanks. But that's what it was. That was seriously what it was like this blitz thing. But here's the amazing thing. That planted the seed. That's all it took was that reasoning with the Jews in the synagogue was the seed that was planted that birthed a church that would become a very, very significant church. That little, little moment was all it took for God to start 
something incredible. And maybe here's point number one. There's not really a point, like a point number one behind me. But already from this message, maybe you can get this. You never know what your small obedience will lead to. God uses small things to do great things. Very often throughout scripture, a little bit of oil, a little bit of flour, a little bread and fish. He takes these little things and he does these incredible, miraculous things with him. That one person at work who you share your faith with, it's just one person. It's not that big of a deal. I just said a couple of words. That friend that you invite to church, that act of kindness you do in Jesus' name, God uses often small beginnings to bring about big changes. So here's what I'm saying. Just in the outset, take the opportunities. Take the opportunities God gives you to witness to others, to show love and to show kindness, because it may be a really small thing for you, but you don't know what God has planned for that. I'm telling you, if you could hear those testimonies we heard of the people who got baptized, if you heard their full version of the story, they would all start with one person who did something small in their lives. It was one mom who was praying. It was one person, one leader who invited them. It was one friend who, who came alongside them at youth. Small things lead to big things. So Paul preaches in the synagogue. He leaves. He leaves behind him. A small church is born in this huge city. And it would have been on his third missionary journey, a couple of years later, that Paul would make a point to stop in Ephesus. He said he would, didn't he? He said, God willing, I'll be back. And it was a couple of years later, and he was back. And he, he made a point to stop there and to strengthen the believers in that space. And so now it's not Acts chapter 18. We go to Acts chapter 19, verse 8 to 10. Let's read there. It says, then Paul went to the synagogue, probably the same place he started a couple of years earlier. And he preached boldly for the next three months. So this wasn't a, a little quick thing. Now he's here. He's preaching boldly for the next three months in the synagogue the Jewish place of worship, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. The way, of course, is just Christianity. It was what it was known as in that time was the way with a capital W. And then it says, so Paul left the synagogue and he took the believers with him. So although there were stubborn hearts there, not everyone was stubborn. There was a softness and people did believe and accept the message that he was preaching. And he took the believers with him. Then he held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for the next two years. So that people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. Wow. That's commitment. Paul spent two to three years teaching in the city building and strengthening the church there. And it was about a decade, about 10 years after the church was started, while Paul was under house arrest in Rome, that he wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus. So by now, the church wasn't just a, a little sprinkling of people. He had been there, preaching there, building up the church for years, but now had been arrested and was sitting at his home, not able to leave or anything like that arrested and writing letters to a couple of the churches that he had established. And one of the churches was this one in Ephesus. And so would have been when he was writing this letter, it would have been the early 60s, the original 60s, uh, some probably 30 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, he was writing these things to the churches. And so this is one of the few letters that Paul writes, which isn't correcting things. So a lot of the letters he's writing to say, you're doing this wrong, you need to do this, this is how you should worship, these are the ways you should treat people, this is what it looks like to be. And he's correcting things quite often in a lot of his letters, things that he's heard or seen. But this isn't one of those letters. The letter to the Ephesians that he writes is actually commending them. It's very often well done. You're doing so good. I love to, to see how your faith has grown. I love to see your acts of kindness. You, you're doing good things well done. So it was a, a letter really commending the church for their faith and their love and the way they spread the gospel. Does that help you? That's just general context for the letter that he wrote. Now I want to look at just a little bit of, well, what, what did he cover in the letter? It's only six chapters. If you read this letter from Front to back, probably take you 25 minutes, half an hour max. It's not a lot. 
But in six chapters, he covers some wonderful, wonderful truths. And so the interesting thing about the book of Ephesians is it is six chapters, and it's like the first half he writes for a specific reason, and the second half he writes for a different reason. And so there's quite a neat divide between chapters 1, 2, and 3 and chapters 4, 5, and 6. And so chapters 1 to 3 is this, what you should believe as a Christian. So the sit, walk, stand, this is the sitting part. This is what should you believe? What have you got in Christ? Who are you in Christ? What is your inheritance as a Christian? Where do you stand if you believe in Christ? Well, what does that mean for you? It's the sitting part. It's chapters 1, 2, and 3. But then chapters 4, 5, and 6 are how you should behave as a Christian. So if you believe this, well, this is how you should be behaving. This is how you should be acting. And he goes into the walking part. Not the sitting, but now it's the walking. So what does it mean? If you say you're a Christian and you believe these things, what does it look like to walk in the light? What does it look like to walk and talk honoring God? What does it look like as a husband or a wife? to be a Christian if this is the thing you believe. So it's the walking and the standing part of the letter. And so the first half is dealing with justification. I know this is sounding pretty technical now, but it's important to know this stuff. Justification. The easiest way people like to remember this is just as if I'd justified, just as if I'd never sinned. Justification is an instant thing. Justification happens in a moment, sometimes in a church setting like this, sometimes at youth, sometimes on a camp, sometimes in your bedroom, sometimes with a friend or a family member. Justification is me saying, I need Jesus. What I'm doing isn't working. He has a plan for me. He loves me. He will forgive me. I need a new start. I follow him. In a moment... It's not just a physical thing that happens. In a moment, something spiritual and supernatural happens. Your spirit is awakened. It's made alive. And in a moment, you are moved from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It's the moment that the disciples, when Jesus went to them, and they were just fishermen doing their own thing, and he said to them, follow me, and they dropped everything, and they followed him. And all of a sudden, They are followers of Christ. Justified is quick, it's once, and it happens, and it's powerful and supernatural. Sanctified is the process of becoming more like Jesus. Part one of Ephesians, chapters one, two, and three, that's all about justification. That's all about what does it mean to be saved? How do you get saved? What about forgiveness? Chapters four, five, and six, well, how do you live this out? Now what? I'm, I've got a lot of years to live on this planet. How am I supposed to, what am I do with my faith? So the first half is justification, being right with God. The second half is us becoming like Jesus. The first half is focused on forgiveness. The second half is focused on our holiness. The first half is what happens inside the church. The second half is how we live outside the church. So the first half deals with the vertical dimension of the gospel, right? Us and God. The second half deals with the horizontal dimension of the gospel, us and other people. So we've got to have both. If we are to understand and embrace the full gospel, everything that it is, we've got to have this dimension and we have to have this dimension. There are people that think Christianity is just about being a do-gooder. It's just about this dimension, me and other people. If I can help the most people, I can help. And you know what? That's a weak and watered-down version of Christianity. If all it is about is doing good things for good people, is that really all your Christianity is about? On the other side, there are people who think Christianity is just about being saved. Well, me and Jesus and no one else. I don't need anyone else. I don't need to do anything else. I've got my golden ticket to heaven. Everything's fine. There's no horizontal part. To me, that's a sad and a selfish idea of Christianity. I've got my ticket. I don't care about anyone else. As long as I make it, I'm good. 
That's a sad and a selfish version of Christianity. You've got to have both. Christianity that is able to save us and that leads us to doing good works. You must have both. Are you still with me? Okay. Here's the thing. It's also got to be in that order. It's got to be able to save us, and then it leads to good works. We've got to sit first, and then we've got to walk. It's got to be in that order because every other religion in the world works the other way around. Every other religion. They say you must be good before God can accept you. I must do this. I must say this. I may, must pray like that. Then God will accept me. But Christianity is unique. It says you are accepted by God first, just as you are, so that he can make you what he wants you to be. Remember this. There was friendship before there was a fall. There was a walk with Christ. They would walk with Jesus, with God, in the garden, before there was a fall. You can't live the Christian life before you believe it. It doesn't work for very long. I've seen this in some people, particularly in my days as a youth pastor, my years of doing that. And people get excited. You know, they invite a friend and that friend gets excited at youth. And maybe you've experienced this yourself or even in church and you get excited about the things of God. And so you sign up to serve and you start giving and you start attending everything. But here's the thing, you run out of steam because you haven't sat. You just started walking. But there's no sitting to understand what it means to be a follower of Christ and what God has done for you, with you, in you. And so you're just in a Christian in doing mode. And it should not be like that. If you've tried that, you know how exhausting that can be to just keep on trying to do the right stuff. Trying to behave like a Christian without believing like a Christian. That's exhausting. And you always feel like you're not getting it right and it's not working. You can't behave like a Christian before you believe like a Christian. So hopefully as we journey through Ephesians, you're going to come to a point where you truly put your faith in Jesus if you haven't already. And maybe that's even today. So let me do something now. I'm going to flash. I'm going to quickly, quickly flash through chapters 1 to 6 to tell you what's coming. My point today, my biggest, biggest, biggest point today is that I would whet your appetite for the book of Ephesians. If you go home today and you say, you know what, I think I'm actually going to read through this book, or I think I'm going to do this devotional, or I think I need to start reading my Bible again, or I need to start reading Ephesians, then the goal is achieved for me from today, that, you would, that your appetite would be whet for this, because it is incredible. This book has so many wonderful, profound truths in it that are easy for us to grasp. So... Chapter 1, Paul helps believers to understand how great a salvation God has blessed them with. And isn't it true that we can take our salvation for granted? I definitely can. And I just, oh, yeah, okay. But when you think of that, when you think of being where I once was, where I would have been had it not been for God, Man, and he reminds us how incredible our salvation really is. The blessing we have of being adopted into Christ's family. You know, for those for, for children who are adopted in the natural here, here on, on earth, and you know, it's a big deal. Maybe they're orphaned or their parents, there's some some issue or whatever it might be, and they're adopted into a loving family. It's a very, very big deal. And for us, we come as sinful, broken people adopted into the family of Christ, finding our place with Jesus as our brother is amazing. So the blessing we have to be adopted into his family, that's really in chapter one. Chapter two, he focuses on the wonderful life we have as believers because we've been raised to brand new life with Christ. There is excitement in the Christian life. It shouldn't be dark and dreary and depressing and lack fun and energy and ugh. Like, oh, I've got to go do this. I've got to, you know, I've got to give. I've got to go to church. I've got to. No, no, it shouldn't be like that. There is so much that God has for us. And he highlights a lot of that stuff. Unity in the church. At that stage, it was Jews and Gentiles. But you know what? We need unity in the church as well. It may not be Jews and Gentiles, but it's definitely old and young. It's definitely rich and poor. 
It's definitely black and white and colored and Indian and the others. <laughs> it just is. We're diverse. We think differently. We're wired differently. We need unity. And he speaks into unity in chapter 2. Chapter 3, Paul lays out God's mysterious, that's what he calls it, God's mysterious plan. And what is that mysterious plan? The mysterious plan is that this party isn't just for the Jews. <laughs> but we get to be invited as well. And that's awesome. So that's chapter 3. Chapter 4. And this is where we move from sitting to standing or to walking. Chapter 4, he talks about the importance of us living out our Christian faith. Living out this new nature that's inside of us. Instead of going back to the old sinful flesh nature. In chapter 5, Paul talks about the importance of us using our spiritual gifts. And being filled with the Holy Spirit. Then he moves on to how living out our faith looks in different scenarios as a husband and a wife. For example, that's one of, the, one of the examples that he brings out. So if you're a husband or a wife here, you probably want to catch that one. Chapter 6, he ends off speaking about how we as Christians are in the middle of a spiritual battle. This is the stand part. So we've had the sit, walk, and then chapter 6 is really the stand. He's saying, okay, great, now you know what you believe. You know why you were created to do good works, to make a difference. But there's a battle, and you need to stand. And, of course, this is the well-known chapter on the armor of God and speaking about all we need to wear as his followers. And so that's just a very, very brief outline for chapters 1 to 6, and there's a lot in those short chapters. But I want to end today leaning into one very small thing. So remember, we're going to go in the next three weeks, we're going to go sit, walk, stand. But for today, just a little bit of the sit. I'm just going to touch on the sitting, okay? Because I think it's, it's so wonderful to just end like this. And one of the powerful themes that Paul speaks about in this letter is our inheritance in Christ. Now, we know what an inheritance is, right? All of us know an inheritance. You, you, you get to be the blessed by an inheritance, if someone thought ahead, if someone planned ahead that when they passed away, their stuff would go to people, and it's wonderful. It's wonderful for the people who receive it. Of course, we, it's not wonderful in the sense that the person has to die for you to receive it. But it's wonderful that they had the forethought and the planning to be able to plan for the people that they could be a blessing once they've passed away. And so what... One of the things Paul highlights is that we have a spiritual inheritance that Christ has made possible for us. And he did die, which means it's available. There's nothing more we're waiting for. But an inheritance is pretty useless if you don't know it's there. An inheritance is pretty useless if you have no idea that you have access to it. It's like us, any one of us having a, a long lost relative and, you, well, they, they were rich and you, you just never heard that you were a beneficiary. It's useless, isn't it? Then it doesn't matter. Then an inheritance, it doesn't matter how much it is. It makes no difference. It's possible to have an inheritance and to never claim it. What a sad thing that is. Either because you didn't know about it or because you weren't sure you could claim it. And I read a story, and, and some of you might know the story. It's a... It's a it's, an out, it's a phenomenal story, and it's not from that long ago, i got to tell you. It was a story about two absolutely penniless guys in their early 40s, literally my age, eking out a living, like scratching by, barely able to survive week to week, selling scraps of metal and whatever. It's literally like dumpster diving, finding cans, selling it at recycling, and being able to eat for the day. We're talking about people who are severely poor, not people who are living in a home. These people were so poor, they were living in a cave in Budapest. That's pretty poor. How long ago are we talking? 15 years. That's not a long time ago, okay? 15 years is pretty recent. Many, most people in here were alive 15 years ago. But they were so poor, they made money by selling scrap they found on the streets. And their mother 
who had come from a pretty wealthy family in Germany, she had cut off ties with them. She had three children, a daughter and two sons. The two sons were living in a cave in Budapest. The daughter was living in America. And she had completely cut ties with her kids. Not only that, she had cut ties with her own family, her mother and, and that side of things. And so she was isolated and alone, and eventually she died. But then when the grandmother, her mother, also died, the lawyers in Germany, and I'm not sure if this is something they still do or not, but they made a massive effort to find out, well, who does this woman's money go to? It would go to her daughter, but her daughter's dead. So who are the next descendants that are meant to receive this inheritance? And so they did a lot of scratching and eventually found out that this woman had had a daughter and the daughter had had two sons and a daughter in Budapest and in America, and they tracked them down. Their names were Salt and Giza. Salty Giza. And they've tracked down these two men, young men. They were only in their early 40s. And the lawyers traced the descendants. They discovered these three grandchildren who were found to be the rightful beneficiaries, listen to this, of $6.6 billion. It's a true story. You need to look these guys up. <laughs> Go check out their cave now. <laughs> okay. They own the cave. Okay. They own the mountain the cave is in. Okay. That is a significant amount of money. They didn't know that that was coming to them. They had, they, they had no relationship with their mother, let alone their grandmother. And so they, was, they were surviving on scraps, surviving on selling cans and getting a little money, not realizing that there was a 2.2 for each of them billion dollars. That's pretty intense. But if you think about it, Many, many believers, many, many believers live spiritually impoverished lives, scratch out a living, barely surviving, just doing enough to get by, living on just above empty their tanks, spiritually speaking, not understanding and not knowing that there's an inheritance that's theirs. These guys could have died penniless and poor if they never found out, if the lawyers didn't do their work. And here's the thing. Christ died. Of course, he raised again. But Christ died, leaving us a spiritual inheritance. And if you don't know what that is, how can you enjoy it? How can you take advantage of it? How can you access it? If you don't even know the spiritual inheritance that he's left you and me. It's rightfully Ours, how amazing is that? And I think we can live far below what God intended for us to live when we don't understand the inheritance that Christ has made for us, the provision that he's made for us. We have incredible riches available to us. And I will say this, and I mean this, worth more than 6.6 .6 billion. The inheritance we have is priceless. And yet sometimes we treat it as if it's not that much. We have wonderful riches available to us. The Holy Spirit is part of that inheritance, that we would have the helper because Jesus ascended, that we would have knowledge and understanding of God, that we would have the hope that he's called us to, that we would have his great power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in us, that we would have his mercy and his forgiveness. There's an inheritance that we couldn't get if Christ didn't die. If he didn't die and defeat sin and death, well, we would, then we just die in our sins, don't we? But we have life and we have forgiveness because he died. What a wonderful, wonderful inheritance. And even though that's the case, we've got this inheritance. How many of us struggle under the weight of sin? Not realizing the power of Christ in us to overcome. How many of us are more interested in scrolling on screens than deepening our knowledge of God, even though we have access to? How many of us struggle under the cloud of depression and anxiety when God longs to reveal the hope he's called us to? 
I'm going to ask you to stand. Let's, let's close off this morning. In this letter, Paul is assuring the Ephesian church, and he's assuring us too, right here and now, that the inheritance is here for us. And we can be bold enough to claim it. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to explore some things that Paul says that we can enter into and enjoy as part of our inheritance. So that's going to be next week as we look at the sitting part. What is it? And how do we access, if I can say that, the inheritance? Do you want to go read the book or not? Come on. You can do it. You're going to do it. You're going to go home. You can read this thing. You've got a week. It'll be easy peasy. If you read one chapter a day, you'll be, you'll be done by the time next, the, the next service starts. No problem. But that really is my goal for today, that you'd be excited about reading the Word of God that you would get things out of it and maybe you'll get some amazing things I didn't even get. How cool is that? I'd love to end today just praying. Just praying for anyone here. And, and you know what? It's kind of a weird message in the sense that it's introductory, in the sense that it's information telling you about the letter. But on the other hand, there's some things that have been highlighted today which I really believe can be helpful. One of them is that Jesus has done all that needs to be done for you to be in relationship with him. These testimonies of these four people and in the previous service, five people that have had a genuine touch of God, that have had that justified moment, that moment of I'm giving up my life and I'm following you, Jesus. It's very powerful. It's instant. And in that moment, your spirit comes alive. And I don't want to just move on from this morning and assume that everyone has had that experience, has had that encounter. But if that is you today and you say, well, I think maybe that's the reason I actually came here. That's the reason I'm in church today is I need Jesus. I, I want to follow him. I want that justification just as if I'd never sinned. That forgiveness, that new start that clean slate. And if that is you, I'm going to ask that you in a moment would just raise your hand and I'd love to pray with you. That's step one. And then you go on this incredible journey. And so let me ask you now, and, and, and while everyone's eyes are closed, heads are bowed, so there's a moment for you and God, if there's someone I can pray with today, I would love to be able to do that, to introduce you to this God who loves you so much. And if that's you, won't you just, wherever you're standing, just raise your hand high enough for me to be able to see it. I'll acknowledge you and then we can pray. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, G. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. There's, thank you. God bless you. There's many people. I think maybe about 10 or so that I can see. Is there anyone else that you just say, this is me? I just, I'm going to pray in a moment. I just want to give anyone else a chance. This is your moment. It's the moment that you begin to follow Jesus. You put aside your dreams, your hopes, your ambitions, your goals, your life plan, and you say, God, wherever you want me, that's where I want to go. Jesus, whatever you want to do with me, do that. Wherever you want to lead me, lead me there. When you say go, I'll, I'll go. Let's pray together as a family. And for you praying this prayer for the first time, we trust for God to do something incredible in your heart in this moment. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you love me so incredibly much. Thank you that you made a plan for me that I couldn't make for myself. I was lost in my sin. But thank you for Jesus who was punished in my place, who died in my place so that I could be free, so that I could be forgiven. God, please forgive me and make me new. I love you. And from today, 
I give you all of me. I surrender my life. Use me however you want to. I follow you and you alone from today onwards. Help me to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.